I was born in Houston, Texas in uh, June 26 of 1949 and uh, grew up in uh, the South Park area when I was from about when I was born till about four or five years old. Then we moved to Sharpstown, which was a huge, huge subdivision with schools in it and shopping and had a swimming pool and the, all the stuff. And uh, we lived there for about uh, seven years, eight years maybe. And then we moved to another part of Houston, uh, which was newer out on Westheimer and uh, stayed there for only about a year and a half. And then we moved up to uh, Michigan and spent, I spent two years there in Michigan. And then we moved from Michigan to Connecticut and I spent about two years there too. And graduated in Galveston, Texas at Kerwin High School in 1968. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of 16-year-olds um, you could drink in uh, New York when you were 18, so there was obviously a lot of alcohol use going around. But um, uh, going down to Greenwich Village in New York and uh, going to concerts in New York, there was a lot of uh, the Mamas and the Papas and... Um, Steppenwolf and some of the early rockers, you know, the animals uh, were playing music. And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, Vietnam seemed so far away, but yet I was, had been brought up that, you know, communism was the worst thing that could happen. And I, and I thought, well, you know, there's, there's, those people want to be free of communism, which was the way it was presented to the American public. That was the way it was presented that, yeah, hey, we got a country over here that wants to be free of communists, just like Ukraine and the Russians. But once we got over there, you know, it, everything wasn't as it appeared. But, uh, yeah, it was in the news, and uh, almost every night, you know, on the, on the nightly news is where they'd show pictures of Vietnam, you know, what was happening over there. And then it just seemed like it got more aggravating, you know. They bombed uh, one of our ships, I believe, and uh, uh, that, of course, just made made me more irritated about the whole thing, you know, that that the communists were over there, you know, screwing around with us, you know. I was, yeah, I was in Connecticut. Um, I graduated from high school in, in uh, May, and in, I went back in Galveston. Then I went back to my parents' house in Connecticut, and I had a chance to go play football at uh, uh, at Huntington, uh, West Virginia, at, uh, and I can't even think of the, the school there, uh, Marshall. Marshall, yeah, I was. I had been accepted there, and I and they were going to give me a football scholarship. Also, I had several offers from here in Texas too. And uh, I decided I didn't want to play football. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to college. So it was pretty, you know, at least when you're drafted, I mean, when, you're, when you enlist, you can choose what you want to go into. They don't make that decision for you. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I wanted to be a medic, and I didn't think, and I knew if I just waited for getting, uh, drafted I'd be in the infantry which I ended up in the infantry anyway so it really didn't matter but you know back in back then I didn't know that did you become a medic to try to avoid the infantry 
No, no, it, it was just I, I was interested in medicine. And I, when I was in junior high, I was a candy striper at a hospital. And I worked with patients, burn patients and stuff like that. Okay. And I was, you know, 13. What is a candy striper? A uh, candy striper was a, uh, a volunteer young person. And we wore red and white shirts, and that you know it looked had red and white stripes. Mm -hmm. It was called candy, <laughs> candy stripers. But yeah, it, and it was uh, so. I did that, and I you know I, I liked medicine, and I was interested in that. So I thought you know first start at the bottom and see what what happens, you know. Went to, yeah, I left on uh, like the 3rd of July on basic training and we got there at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. They picked us, we, we were in Connecticut and then we went to New York City and got on an airplane. And then that airplane took us to Columbia, South Carolina, which is where Fort Jackson, South Carolina is. And it's still a, a big training area up there still and a lot of pine trees and a lot of sand. They love that sand, you know, if you can run around in the sand, you know, that's good for you. So anyway, uh, that's where I, and then the next day was 4th of July, so they could, they were off that day, so they let us do, we just roamed around the fort, you know, we couldn't go off the base, but we roamed around. Mm -hmm. And then, then all hell broke loose, you know, the next day. Then we, they owned us, you know. Was one of the first things they did is shave all of your heads in the barbershop? Oh, yeah. And some people, you know, like myself, I went with a short haircut thinking, well, you know, at least they won't be screaming at me, you know, if my hair is down to here, you know, so. Mm. Uh, but that isn't the case. They screamed at you anyway. The basic training was run by mostly NCOs, which are non-commissioned officers, which are enlisted men, not officers. And most of those men had already served a tour in Vietnam. Because remember, this was in 1968. I suppose some of them may have been Korean vets as well. Yeah, oh yeah, some of them. But most of them were Vietnam vets, you know. And so, you know, they were there for one thing, and that was trying to get us, shape us into something that could get over there and, and not all get killed, but get back, you know, maybe, maybe wounded, maybe, maybe some bad stuff like that. But all in all, just to, to they try to train you of what's getting ready to happen to you. Do you remember how many weeks basic training was? It was, uh, I think it was 10 weeks. They cut it back down to eight weeks shortly after I took mine, but it was, uh, it was 10 and then they cut it back to eight because they needed men so bad. Mm -hmm. So, and then after, on basic we learned, you know, everything that we, a lot, a lot of the same things we used in Vietnam. I mean, exactly the same thing, you know. Do you remember anything that stands out to you or that you hated about basic training? Yeah, I hated the rifle range because I, I, uh, the cartridges, me being a left-handed shooter and there's, they were, uh, the cartridges, would come back and hit me in the face, you know. What weapon were you using? M14. M14. M14, yeah. Very good rifle, uh, but as soon as we got to Vietnam, uh, the M16. In fact, in my medical training, we qualified with weapons too, and we qualified with the M16. How large of a group were you in during basic training? I'd say there was about, we were in platoon size groups. I'd say there was about, let's see, 10, 20, maybe 40, 
40 of us together, maybe 38, you know. And then how many drill instructors or NCOs were there? Probably four, you know. And they're not all, you know, some of them would be not working all the time. Or there'd be some other guys come in, too, that were not drill sergeants, but they were helpers, you know. Mm -hmm. And they took us maybe on a run or maybe... In basic training, you don't walk anywhere. You double time everywhere. And you keep your, even in the summer, you keep your, they want you to keep your uh, uh, fatigue uh, buttoned, the, the uh, arms, you know. They didn't want you rolling up your sleeves and stuff until this lieutenant came along and told the drill sergeants, you know, these men need to, raise up their sleeves you know they're getting too hot so but you know that was the same in Vietnam it was so hot that it was almost unbearable well that's you need to learn how you know you can survive in that kind of heat but you got to know what you're doing you know as far as taking your drinking your water and staying hydrated and stuff you know mm -hmm. so but Everything they did was geared to that. I mean, we had what was called, uh, we didn't call it guard duty. It was called, I forget what the name of it was, was, um, well, it was fire duty. It was called fire duty because the barracks we were in were 1930s, and, man, they were like a tinderbox. And so, you know, you had to stay, you you walked around the barracks all for an hour and then you woke up the next guy and then he woke up the next guy and so on and so forth all the way through the night. It started about eight o'clock in the evening and, and ended about five o'clock in the morning. Four to five, I think was the last, the last gore, uh, fire duty watch. What was your typical daytime schedule like? Get up at 4.30 or 5 and then uh, go out and do calisthenics and run. Uh, and then uh, come back, get your barracks squared away, then go eat breakfast. Then go back to your barracks and probably clean the floors and, you know, do the serious stuff. The latrine, the bathroom, you clean it. And everybody had to pitch in and clean, you know. It didn't matter who you were. You better just get your ass over there and start cleaning it. Did any of the people you were with in basic training carry on with you? No, no. I, I didn't, uh, uh, no. You didn't see any of them in Vietnam? No, not that I know of, you know. Maybe I did. Now, I saw some guys from my high school class in Vietnam, of all, of all things. Wow. And one of them is, it was in the Marines, you know, and one was in the Air Force. But I happened to see them, you know, and that was just, that's luck. Small world. Do you remember any incidents that stick out to you from basic training? Like people getting in trouble or any bad accidents? No, I, we didn't have any th that. I guess the thing that stand out to me was boxing, you know, and I always put the small guy against the big guys, you know. Were you using bare knuckles? No, no, we had boxing gloves. Did you guys have a ring? Yeah, a ring and had a headgear and all that stuff. And we'd box for passes, you know, to go into, to get off on Saturday and Sunday, you know. So that was always fun. I always liked it. I always did well. So I was a real scrapper. <laughs> Went to medic training. Now, was that at a different site? That was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, in okay. San Antonio, Texas. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and it was a 10-week school also. And there at that school, I mean, we learned how to, to uh, uh, give shots, start IVs, um, suture, um, 
x-ray you know so we learn you know to, how to do the x-ray machine and where to put you know the plates and stuff and where we didn't we didn't spend a lot of time on that but we we learned that and then a lot of things on on the four things that you do out in the field was you know first thing you do is clear the airway the guy's choking to death you know on his own vomit or his own blood or whatever you know you've got to clear the airway and uh, then you protect the wound and then you treat for shock and I can't even think what the other thing is but uh, start an IV and you know I was good at that good at and we did it on each other and we did the shots on each other too. Not too many though, and not too many IVs. If if your instructor saw that you could do it, you know that you were capable of doing it without taking somebody's arm off. You know they were fine with that. You know. Was it a lot more relaxed compared to basic training? A lot more. A little. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know the. We still did, we still ran and we still did that type of thing because there was a lot of people that were going to go to airborne school and they wanted to keep you as fit as possible. And those who went right from medic school to, air, to Vietnam, you know, they want you to come over there in good shape, not out of shape. And although there was a lot of out of shape people in the army at that time. I don't think it anymore that they put up with that. I think, you know, you gotta stay within a certain range of weight. You know, according to your height, I'm sure. At medic training, I'm assuming they introduced you to the typical kit you'd carry in the field? Oh uh, yeah, our medic bag. Can you talk about what was in that kit? Yeah, uh, well we had the things that weren't in a kit that I carried in my, my pocket up here on my fatigue shirt was the morphine serrets. And all they were, were they were little, they had, a, they had a, a needle on them, but they were like a tube of toothpaste and you just, except they were small. You just stick one in the thigh like that mm -hmm. and then just squeeze that morphine on into it. You see, what I'm, you know what I'm saying. So you kept those ready to go. Yeah, I kept those ready to go at a heart. The only people you did not give morphine serrets to were people with head head injuries, head wounds, mm -hmm. and also people with sucking chest wounds. And those were just two of the things that you couldn't use morphine on. And uh, other than that, I mean, lifesaver, because man, I mean, some of the wounds are were bad and they hurt bad, I know, you know. I mean, uh, that stuff, man, that, those grenades and bullets and stuff, they're meant to kill people. I mean, and more than kill them, man, they maim them. I mean, that M16, that round is, was a bad round, you know. Yeah, meant to tumble and create large wound channels. Yeah, go in and come out this big in the back, you know. So, but yeah, the aid bag was a bag and it, it was about the size, about this, this large. Yeah, about this big uh -huh. and then about that big. And wide. What, what did you have in it? And I had all my medicines in there. I had I had a, a, all my bandages. I mean, I carried extra bandages, big bandages in my rucksack, but I carried all my standard bandages in there, and all my ointments and salves, and then all my uh, drugs. You know, Dor from Dorvon to Percocet to uh, Valium at that time. Valium was fine to give to people, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't give a lot, but you know, enough to keep the ch the chill off. Uh, what else did I carry in there? Oh, I carried needles. I carried suture material. C 
carried alcohol, peroxide, uh, uh, Fisahex. It came in a green bottle. It was a surgical soap that you could wash your hands, you know, because mm -hmm. your hands were filthy when you were treating wounds. So for rapid disinfection? And yeah, general. right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I carried all that stuff, and then uh, malaria pills. They took one. They took one white pill once a week, and then they took an orange pill every day. And I had to pass those, make sure they took those every day. But still, you you can catch malaria. I had also pills for water, uh, purification tablets. And they were all issued, I issued them purification tabs before we'd ever even go out, you know, because mm -hmm. dysentery was rampant. I mean. I'm assuming that would be part of your standard kit. It is, it's part, it's a army medical kit, you know, mm -hmm. and then each medic gets to customize it, what, how you want to pack it and how you want to carry it. But, uh, uh, so it was it was my life it was my you know thing that that kept people alive My parents took me to the airport in Houston and uh they were pretty upset about me going to Vietnam you know but just one of those things How old were you at the time? Uh, I was 19 and so, uh, and it was uh, March, uh, and so it was still pretty cool over here, you know, as far as temperatures went and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I went out to the West Coast, out to San Francisco is where uh, Travis Air Force Base, and that's where we left from. And it was definitely out of San Francisco, it was cool during the winter time. So, you know, get, get all our stuff, get our fatigue, our jungle fatigues, and get all the stuff, uh, not, not everything, just the jungle fatigues is all we got, and no weapons or anything like that. And got on a, uh, a commercial airline, I think it was, uh, I don't know if it was commercial, it might have been owned by the CIA, it was called Flying Tiger, I know it was CIA airplane, but they had regular stewardesses and stuff on there, you know, regular pilots and stuff. The CIA just had that aircraft. Yes, it wasn't a military car. No, airplane. no, no, not at all, not at all. And uh, and on the way back from Vietnam, I flew on a regular commercial airline. You know, I think KLM or uh, I can't even remember, you know. So you left from San Francisco. San Francisco, yeah. And then where did you arrive? We we went first to Alaska, to Anchorage, Alaska, to Elmendorf Air Base and refueled. And I mean, it was snowing and, you know, we could look out the windows of the aircraft. We didn't get out, you know, because all they were doing was just refueling. Mm -hmm. And then we flew from there to Hawaii and then from Hawaii to Cameron Bay in Vietnam. Where is Cameron Bay? Cameron Bay was uh, probably about uh, 40 miles from Saigon. So in the south of Vietnam? Yeah, South China Sea, yeah, in that area. So you arrived there, and then what was next? Went to Long Bin. We arrived at Long Bin. I left, I returned from Cameron Bay. We went to Long Bin, and that was uh, still in south pretty south Vietnam, you know, southern Vietnam, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And walk off the airplane, and man, I mean, uh, I know you've been to Belize, and it's just like that hot, hot, humid air hits you, you know, and it's just, it's, it's terrible. And the smell is a peculiar smell that that you don't smell around here. It's somewhere between urine, feces, um, 
burning uh, feces because that's they use you know diesel fuel and stuff to mm-hmm. burn that with. And it was the worst smell that I've ever had in my life. And that was when you arrived there at the base. Yeah, that was at walking out of the airplane down the steps. You know, and hot, hot as shit, you know, and you got those khakis on, you know, or fatigues on, and they're long sleeved and stuff, and it just, you know, hot as hell. And this was your first experience with true jungle, right? Well, no, there was no jungle around. It was a big, it was a big Air Force base, and they had, you know, lots of airplanes sitting around, and there was a, a lot of big buildings and stuff. Not you know, buildings made out of just framed up and then made with tin on them, you know, not not real Quonset hut stuff like that. When I say buildings, I don't mean like 10-story buildings and stuff like that. After you arrived there, what was next? Then, you know, we waited there for a couple of days and then they told us, you know, we're figuring out now what unit you're going to go to, what, who needs medics, who needs this, who needs that. Well, 4th Infantry Division, which I think you've done some reading on, was up in the Central Highlands of, of uh, Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And that's, they needed medics because they had lost a bunch of medics. And this was around the Play Coup area, Play right? Coup area, yes, it was. It was. That's where Camp Ernie was where our... Ernie, E-A-R-N-E-Y, it was a guy that first guy got killed in the 4th Infantry Division. And so you were not with anybody you went to training with, correct? No, absolutely not. You were just being slotted in for someone who had gotten killed in that area. Yes, yeah, right, right. I reported to the division surgeon, uh, Major Murray, and he's a doctor, and he told me, you know, where I'd be going. After I got to the 4th Infantry Division, he told me where I would be going to what company and what, uh, I went to Bravo Company 1st, 3rd Battalion, 12th Infantry. Can you talk a little bit about what are the sizes of these different groups you're referring to? Platoon is, is, a squad is your smallest group primarily, and there's usually three squads, four squads in a platoon, Uh and usually about 40 men in a platoon, but the platoons over there ran from about 15 to 25 men. Very seldom did you ever see a full-strength platoon, because they just, they couldn't bring in enough people to take care of the ones that got wounded, ones that got, you know, got dis, that, that, spent their year there, didn't get hurt or anything, and then, you know, just got discharged, you know? I mean, you have to replace every, try to replace, you know? It's terrible trying to get replacements. But, uh, so that, that would be, that would be your, the squad would be your smallest thing, then the platoon, then a company. And a company would generally have four platoons in it. And so that's about that's about 200 men, you know, mm-hmm. 220 maybe. And then you go to a battalion, and I think a battalion's made up of four to five companies. So that's about 1,000 men, you know. And then you go to uh, a brigade, and I think brigade is probably another four battalions or five battalions, you know, so about 5,000. Then you go to a division and you're at like 10,000, maybe 12,000 even. So you got up to play coup area. Yeah, and went, went and I was, we had to report to Major Murray and I reported to him and he told me why well, I was going to go to Bravo Company, 3rd Battalion, 12th Infantry. And I got to Bravo and their medic had got hurt, but he came back. He didn't get hurt that bad. So he came back to B Company, so they moved me then to C Company. And that's where I stayed the rest of my, my time with the 3rd Battalion, 12th Infantry. Yeah, when I, so uh, 
I got there and we had to do at Playku we did we did four days of in country training, which is, was not enough. In which I've read in other articles about uh, two weeks of training is about what you need. You know, what did they try to teach you during those four days? Um, well, we we got our M16s, we got those sighted in, which was great. You know, you needed to get your M16. And then just the things about the jungle, about, you know, about the kind of equipment we were using, um, the different weapons, if you were carrying a 45, which I carried a 45 and a 16 both. A 45 pistol? Yeah, a secondary weapon, you know. Mm -hmm. And you could do that. Some guys, some medics just carried 45s, not me, buddy, I, you know, I needed my M16. <laughs> Those four days, they were getting you ready to go out on your first mission? No, well, they weren't really getting, they were just getting us climatized, trying to get us uh, about, we, we spent a lot of time on booby, booby traps mm -hmm. because, and how to disarm them. Also, how to blow up stuff with C4. We learned about that. Um, we learned a little bit about um, uh, uh, compass reading, map reading, stuff like that, calling in artillery. So, uh, but we, like I said, we didn't have enough time to do all the stuff that I thought we should. Can we talk a little bit about what was in your full kit? Like we already talked about what was in your medic kit, but what else did you carry out in the jungle with you? Okay, I carried, um, I had what's called a rucksack, which is nothing more than a uh, sack that's attached to an aluminum frame. It's a backpack, mm -hmm. except it's big. I mean, it's, you know, about like that. And I carried, I carried a poncho, and a poncho liner. A poncho liner was a piece of material that you could use to uh, stay warm in. I mean, you'd think the jungle is be hot as heck, but we were in mountains too, and at night it'd get down to 50 degrees. Well, if it was 100 during the day, you know how cold 50 would be. And so we had to have a poncho liner. I also had a sweater, that an army sweater that I kept down the bottom of my rucksack, keep it dry, try to keep it dry. And if I get real cold, I'd put that on too. But I never, uh, I slept in full, full regalia every night. I didn't, I didn't uh, take off my boots or anything because it's too hard to find them during, or something starts. Shit, you don't want to walk around barefooted, you know, run around barefooted. And then it takes so damn long to try to find your boots and put them on, you know. So, what else in the pack? Uh, uh, our rations, and we had either sea rations or LERP rations, and the LERP rations are dehydrated rations. They take, take more water. The sea ration doesn't take any water. It's already, you know, it's like beans and franks or spaghetti and balls, you know, or lima beans and ham. Uh, ham slices, you know, kind of thing, beef slices, crackers and jam, uh, pound cake comes in a little can like that, same way with the uh, uh, pecan cake. Were they edible or were they pretty bad? They, they were edible. I mean, you're hungry. <laughs> it, it tastes great, you know, sometimes. And, you know, guys that get seasoning and stuff from home, I wasn't a cooker because my, mom, my sister Margo always cooked. So I didn't cook at home, but I had fr the friends. I, I made a lot of, fr obviously you make friends. That's your best friend. You know, when you, when you get out in the bush with people, they're your best friends. I mean, you're taking care of each other, you know, or you better be because you're not going to make it alone. I mean, you got to take care of each other, but 
a lot of them would get spices sent from home and stuff, and they could spice that stuff up and make it taste just like nobody's business. Then we'd have co they'd have coffee, they'd have hot chocolate, they'd have uh, Hershey bars that were uh, the kind that were real hard because they didn't they didn't melt. You know, they made a special Hershey bar for tropical. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were pretty rank, but they were they were good chocolate, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then I car I carried that. Depending how long you're going to be out for, usually uh, probably get resupplied every five six days. So, you know, a case of sea rations was twelve boxes, twelve meals. And so I usually carry if if it was going to be six days, I'd usually carry six meals. Six of those meals, C rations and six LERP rations. Sometimes maybe eight and four, you know, depending, just depending, you know. Uh, How much water did you carry? I usually carried five, five, six quarts, which sounds like a lot. It is a lot, but if you've ever been without water one time, it'll change your mind about how much you should carry. That and ammunition, you know, if you've ever run out of ammunition in a firefight, the next time you have, you're in a firefight, you'll have enough ammunition. Did you carry the ammunition loose or was it no, loaded in clips? No, it was in, it was in um, uh, the clips, 18 round, there were 20 round clips, but you always only put 18 in there because 20 would jam up the, jam up the system. That's the five five six, correct? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And how many clips do you think you carried? I carried. I'd, I'd carry about twenty. Twenty clips, three hundred sixty rounds. And then how many for the forty five? Uh, probably about seventy five. Okay. What were the forty five clip sizes? Do you remember? Yeah, uh, fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, yeah. So around seven. Yeah, yeah. Seven or eight, you know. And then you also took some grenades. I carried right? a couple of grenades, a white phosphorus grenade, a smoke grenade, a pin flare, uh, a strobe light. You know, I mean, carried all kind of bullshit. A knife, just a regular hunting knife I got, you know, my parents sent me. I asked them to send me one, you know. Um, what else did I carry? Oh, I carried a ammo box, M M60 machine gun. The ammo boxes come in hundred round. The, these boxes, they're about that big, about this tall. Well, they're about that tall, and about this big, and they have a a closure on one end, and they have a ring around uh, a rubber gasket in there, so they can't get wet. Are these the belt-fed machine guns? Uh-huh. Yeah, they put those belts in there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, and sometimes I carry 100 rounds of uh, M60 machine gun, too. But not, not all the time. But uh, I'd keep my cigarettes and pictures and camera and that kind of stuff in that box. Did you carry any C4 or explosives? I carried a stick of C4, not a bunch, you know. I, Did you have claymores or anything like no. that? No. I'd, I'd carry, when, when, I'd, when I ran those couple LERP map missions, yeah, I carried claymores, and I carried more ammunition and a lot less food and a lot less water, too. So is that about everything in the kit? Yeah, that was about everything, but I mean, it it was a heavy, it was heavy. Yeah, you were saying around 80 pounds. Because I used to, what I used to do is I used to sit down and put, let the rucksack, you know, fall off my, come off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. I'd try to get next to a tree, you know, that would be my favorite thing to do. And then when I get, I'd just sit down and put it back on and then, you know, do my hands like this and get back up. But it was heavy. 
A lot of times somebody helped me up, you know, because it was heavy. You were dressed in pretty standard fatigues, right? Yeah, yeah, we had jungle boots on, and they had metal uh, soles. They had a metal piece of metal in the soles mm -hmm. for for booby traps. But that, you know, that, that would help some, but it not not that much. It wasn't going to stop a grenade or something? No, else. hell no, or a toe popper. We had these things called toe poppers, and they were nails with 50 caliber uh, shell on them. And if and if you hit the nail right, it would hit the 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 uh, striking plate and it go off, and they call them toe poppers. It would blast your foot off. Yeah, yeah. And we had those though, mm -hmm. and we we you know we thought somebody was on our trail or something, just put out a couple toe poppers. Did you see many booby traps up where you were? No, we did not. We did not. Uh, I saw a couple, but most of the, we did not. They were mostly all down south. Uh, I saw some old booby traps that had uh, old Punjai stick uh, uh, pits and stuff that had the stick still in them, but they were old, you know. Was there anything about when you arrived there that surprised you? or was very unexpected? Yeah, I have to say the first firefight I was in, I never I never knew. I mean, my thoughts when I went to Vietnam were charmed, you know, maybe I'll get hit, but it won't be bad, you know, which I was lucky I, I didn't get hit bad. But uh, I thought that was a pretty good pretty good uh, deal, at least in my mind it was, that I wasn't going get, to get shot or, you know, and I was going to do this or do that. Mm -hmm. But then in the first firefight you get into, the noises and the sounds and the, just the smells, everything you can think of is just, it's like, it's like, I don't know, it's like total mayhem. I would assume your senses are heightened and everything is slowed down. So slow down. I mean, something you think you've been doing it for two hours, you've been doing it for two minutes, you know? I mean, or you think, you know, God damn, we've been shooting, 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 and it's been only, you know, 30 seconds. I mean, because you can put a lot of fire through an M16, slam those clips in there, you know, at 18, 18 rounds in about five seconds, I think. And I mean... You know, 18 rounds is a lot of firepower. Let's set the stage to talk about your first mission. I would assume most people are familiar with Vietnam through pop culture or movies, where it's traditionally the Viet Cong who uh -huh. are depicted as being the enemy. Right, right. Which are not necessarily professionally trained right. and more guerrilla style fighters. In the Central Highlands where you were, you mostly encountered the NBA, correct? Yeah, hardcore, we call them hardcore NBA, you know. And there were some mainstream uh, Viet Cong that went actually up to the north and went to training up there for like three months or six months of training and then came and infiltrated back down in the south, you know. How would you describe the NBA? I'd say the NBA were dedicated, uh, they were ambitious, they were uh, willing to give them of themselves to to for their country. I guess. I mean, what else? I I don't know what else to say. Yeah. You know. Would you say they were well trained? Trained, well equipped. They had everything that we had, except there are two things they didn't have that we had. We had we had massive firepower that they didn't have. And I mean, that's from our aircraft and stuff that we had put together to give us massive amounts of firepower. They didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And they also didn't have the medical system that we had set up, whereas a guy gets shot and we can have him back in a hospital in like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you know. They didn't have that. I mean, a guy got shot there, they put him on a stretcher 
or on poncho and carried him, you know. And if he had a bad, bad wound, you know, he might not see a doctor for, huh, for two weeks or something, you know. So, he's, you know, the chances are you're going to die. I mean, uh, so those were two things that they didn't have that we had. But I, I would say their tenaciousness, I've never seen people that just keep coming and coming and coming and just keep get falling. And they just keep coming. Fucking laughing and carrying on, you know, and taunting you. I've never seen that, seen, heard of that kind of shit in my life. And then, you know, and then to see it is just, you know, mind blowing. Mind blowing. And how would you describe the terrain up there in the Central Highlands? Yeah, the Central Highlands, beautiful terrain. I mean, beautiful mountains, valleys, lots of jungle, lots of triple canopy, double canopy jungles where you're there during the day and you can't even see the light, you know? It's triple canopy. I mean, it's just unbelievable. One tree on top of the other, you know, just going... Because you're up in the mountains, it could get really cold at night, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've seen it where we look like it. there was uh, uh, freezing stuff on the ground. I mean, it, it got, seemed like to get that cold. But, yeah, it got extremely cold. And especially when it was in the rainy season up in the mountains, oh, it would be... You know, the rain felt great when during the day when it was hot, but at night, oh my God, you talk about, you know, having wet stuff on. Sometimes those poncho liners wouldn't do it, you know. How often would you say it rained? During the rainy season? Every day. Every day. Sometimes for five, ten days at a time. Never stop. And that's when you have a hard time of getting your supplies in because the helicopters couldn't see, didn't have the equipment, the radar or sonar, whatever they needed to be flying to mountaintops in Vietnam during the pouring down rain. Yeah. You know, they just didn't have the visibility. So it would make it hard to resupply and stuff? Yeah, you might not get resupplied for three days. You're out of water, you're out of food, you know, you're out of everything. Also, the uh, area y'all were operating in, y'all were right up against the Cambodian uh -huh. border, correct? Cambodian border and the La and Laotian border, too. And you weren't really supposed to go into those areas, were you? We weren't supposed to, but, you know, shit happens. Yeah, there's no hard-drawn lines. No, here. no, you, don't, you didn't know if you were in Cambodia or if you were in Vietnam. It was kind of, yeah, the border was kind of un, unclarified. There was no fencing or anything saying this is our border. The yeah. first mission I ran was about probably, uh, I got out of that, out of the training in uh, the day. camp there. Your four day orientation. Yeah, orientation. Then I was sent out to my unit. They were out in the field. There was one platoon in the headquarters uh, company, which is your company commander and your company medic, your company uh, radio guy, uh, combat engineer for blowing stuff, blowing up bunkers, stuff like that. And maybe uh, a FO, which is a forward observer who can call in artillery. So I was sent out and we were, my platoon was with them. And we were we were set on a uh, had a perimeter set up and they had brought wire out and stuff and we had strung wire around our perimeter. Well, did you fly helicopters out there? Yeah, we fly. Oh, yeah, you flew everywhere you went. You flew helicopters, except you know when you're out there humping. I mean, you know, that's with the infantry. Everything you own, you carry on your back. You know. So you landed out there with a full platoon and you unloaded? No, well, it was already done when I got there. 
Oh, okay. So they just flew you in. Flew me out there. I want to resupply, I guess. You know, I, I can't remember if there was some other guys that flew there. You know, new guy replacements also. I think there was a couple other replacements. Mm -hmm. And there was probably supplies on there, ammunition, food, whatever, you know. A hot meal, maybe. Maybe. Huh. Uh, and so probably the next day I went out with my platoon uh, with the, my squad, I went out with the squad. I didn't go out with the platoon, and I think the squad had about seven people on it. And uh, we we were walking down a trail, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, we hear one shot, you know, and and it hits a guy that's about three behind me, right in the neck. And uh, so I run over there, you know, put a bandage on his neck and uh, start an IV on him. And uh, by the time uh, that the uh, dust off got there, he was dead. And he had just got back from, he had extended in Vietnam for another six months mm -hmm. and had gone home for a 30 day leave and had a wife and a child. And I mean, you know, I was just, I couldn't believe it. And that was the first day I was, that was the second day I was there, you know. And then about a week later, uh, man, I, all this shit happened to me. As soon as I got in country, I couldn't believe it. And uh, uh, it was about the platoon sergeant, Sergeant Pearson, Tommy Pearson and I, were set up. We were set up in a in a, a our, had our little position where we had a position where both of us slept, and uh, it was on this perimeter, on a perimeter that I was telling you about. So you're out with, with the with the platoon about twenty people. About twenty, yeah, and then the headquarters, you know, headquarters people also, which is about another five or six. So there was probably 30 people out there. So you're out in the middle of the jungle and you dug trenches for the perimeter or foxholes to get into. Yeah, yeah, holes and where we could sleep too, you know. I mean, even though we're sleeping on the ground, you still had need a place to sleep, you know. And so you were kind of just settled in for the night. Right. And I've been... There was, and then next to us, maybe, maybe um, twenty feet away, or 50, about fifteen feet away, was another position that had a machine gun. Okay, had two guys that had the machine gunner, and uh, his name was Gookie, and I can't don't even know what the other guy's name was. He was the ammo. He was the ammunition man. He was the feeder. But anyway, they had them a position set up too, and had them, they had a, 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 a place where they could lay down, you know, side by side and sleep. And we had we had we had a couple guys out in front of us, out in front of the positions, out past the wire. They're called listening posts, and they were out there listening for anything. So man, I mean, we uh, all of a sudden, I heard it. You know, and then this, you know, just a terrible explosion. And it's so close to me. I mean, there's shit flying all around me, you know, and I'm thinking in my ears, you know. I'm, and so the two machine gunners, they fire what was called a P-40 grenade launcher. It's a grenade launcher with a grenade on it. And it must have, they must have been sleeping with their head close to the machine gun because it took off both of the, both of the back of their heads. So they got threw, hit by an enemy RPG. Yes, and it threw them out of the out of their sleeping thing, out of the foxhole, and threw them back back behind the foxhole. The concussion and the round was so heavy on them, you know. And I got out there, and I mean they were both. They were both dying, you know. I couldn't do anything for them. 
I didn't know what to do for him. I mean, I felt inadequate. You talk about, you know, not knowing what to do. But as I later learned, there was nothing I could do for him. There was nothing I was powerful enough to do, you know. I didn't have the knowledge. Nobody had the knowledge to do anything for him. And during the start of this whole thing, you'd taken your shoes off, right? Right, right. And that was the last time you ever did that? That's the last time I ever did that, yeah, yeah. I had my shoes off, man. I was struggling to find them to get them back on because, you know, I mean, it was, we were out in the middle of the bush and it's, it's rock, it's maybe not rocks, but, you know, tree stubs and everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't a clean, nice place like this, you know, where, where you could uh, run around with your shoes off, you know. So they hit the machine gun position with an RPG, and then what happened after that? After that, they started, you know, I ran over to where those, I got my boots on. I didn't tie them, but I got them on at least. And then I ran over there with my bag, and I had a, a, a flashlight with a filter on it, a red filter, you know? Mm -hmm. And I looked down, and I mean, I had blood already all over me because they were just bleeding out, you know, their back of their heads were blown off. And there were, there were other, there were North Vietnamese, I could see them in the wire up there and they were firing down on us and trying to get, trying to get through the wire. And I, man, I opened up with my M16. You know, I don't know. A lot of other people did too, though. So, you know, I wasn't the only one. And so after that, they retreated? Well, we, they, they kept trying to penetrate our wire, and, uh, but we called in artillery on them and called in uh, uh, Puff, the Mat Puff the Magic Dragon came in and had those quad 50s, and he, he was going around this whole circle, our perimeter, and firing them up. And I mean, it, every fourth round or fifth round was a tracer, but they were going out so fast, it looks like just one straight line and it's red, man. And I mean, it's just, it's eating up. It's eating you ass alive. Uh, and we found, we found about 12 dead bodies the next morning. Then we found blood trails and stuff like that. The North Vietnamese and uh, always tried to get their their dead and, and injured out and not let them, the Americans know how many of them they killed. Sometimes it was they couldn't do it fast enough, though, you know, or it was, or you call in like you say napalm or big bomb strikes on them, and then you know, yeah, after uh, Puff got finished with them, I don't think there was much. You know, we probably got most of them. How many guys did you lose in your platoon? Uh, we just lost those two guys, those two machine gunners. But they were right, they were, you know, I've been talking to them four hours before that or three hours before that, you know, well, five hours before that. A funny thing about the infantry is everybody goes to bed about seven o'clock, right? As soon as it gets dark, because you can't smoke, you know, you can't talk, you know, you're trying to keep quiet and no lights or anything. Mm -hmm. And so everybody thus goes to bed real early. You'd have been out, you'd have been, you wouldn't have been good for that. Would you say it was pitch black at night, um, except for you had the, flashlights with the red filter, but you only wanted to use those during emergencies. Yeah, that was just, I just had to see what I was trying to work on. You know, yeah. I didn't know where they were hit. I mean, I just, you know, I knew that they had been blown. I just couldn't believe how far they were. They were probably blown 10, 15 feet wow. out to the back of that, of that, uh, they had had sandbags in front of it and stuff. Shit, those, those recoilless, those um, rocket-propelled grenades, 
shit, those things would go, they'd go right through those sandbags, you know. Napalm, I mean, you just say it's crispy critter time because that's what it is, it's crispy critter. And the stuff will take the oxygen right out of your breath. I mean, it'll take it out of you. And the heat is, is pretty bad also. We always just used to lay low. The, the, the canisters were about this big that come out of the, the jets. And what they do is they, when they come out, they start tumbling like that. Mm -hmm. And you can just see them tumbling right towards the target. <laughs> And I mean, if you're in that target range, you better watch out because you're going to be a crispy critter. And then those guys were dropping 500 pound bombs too, those F4s, F3 fighter planes. And the AE1s were, they had also 500 pound bombs. And those things were the shrapnel and the concussion that they give off. I mean, they'll knock you to the ground. It, it knocks you, you know, it'll knock you down. And there'll be shit flying all over the place, not so much shrapnel, but sticks and rocks and shit, you know, that when that thing hits, man, I mean, you know, pieces of people's bodies. I mean, it's it's terrible. The napalm, it just burns till it can't burn anymore, right? Burns, yeah, it just burns. It once you're hit with it, man, you're finished. You can't put water on it to extinguish it. Oh, hell no. Now white phosphorus. I've seen, I've seen people dig that out on those white phosphorus grenades. Uh -huh. Now, if you take one close, you're dead. But if you just get scattered with a little bit of shrapnel, and that's what I just got, I just got shrapnel, you know, just small pieces, you know. I have a piece here, a piece there. I got a nice piece right in my eye. You see that? right here above shrapnel from a grenade yeah yeah just a small piece you know yeah i mean especially the the i mean all kind of animals i mean elephants tigers uh uh all kind of snakes bow constrictors those tree boas, big boas, they're big. Uh, but those bamboo vipers, man, they're the worst. And they'd be, shoot, you'd be walking through a trail and there might be vipers on both sides just, you know, sitting there going. Do you remember anyone getting snake bite and having to treat them? No, I never had a snake bite. People were too, you know how people are with snakes, man. They're scared. <laughs> yes, but I would assume they would wander into your camp sometimes. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But no, I never saw a snake bite. Uh, but uh, the jungle, you know, the, 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 the humidity and the heat was just, uh, it, it really hurt the American soldier. I mean, uh, the feet, we had terrible problems with feet problems and uh, jungle rot. Uh, which was a thing that caused sores on you, and then they'd open up, you know, and drain and stuff, and they were just nasty. And that's basically caused by walking around in wet socks and stuff? Socks and then dirt and, you know, and then because you might not change uh, fatigues for two weeks or three weeks. Your fatigues, you know, you weren't supposed to change them until they were raggedy, you know. I mean, I want... I walked around with blood on my fatigues for a couple of weeks and it just, the smell of blood is just, it's sickening. You know, it has a sweet kind of sweet smell to it. Mm, that iron smell. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's exactly right, the iron smell. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I didn't like that. I try to wash it out, but you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, creeks and stuff like that in Vietnam, but you know, you might see the most beautiful, serene, clear, clearest water you've ever seen and tasted in your life, and then maybe up a hundred yards away, a water buffalo is taking a shit in there. 
So uh, really had to be careful about the water you drank. And we, we used a lot of purification tablets. It doesn't make your water taste the best, but it'll stop you from having dysentery, mm -hmm. which is once you've had dysentery, once you probably say, I'll, I'll take the pills, you know. What about leeches? Did you see a lot of A lot of, of leeches. Uh, we'd, we'd stop and have leech checks and everybody check each other's backs and uh, their butt, you know. I mean, you know, legs, everything, because they'd be, be all over you. But we had this, this stuff, this uh, insect repellent that everybody carried. It wasn't any good for mosquitoes, man. They loved that shit. But the leeches hated it. And all you do is put a drop or two on them and they'd fall right off. Or if you were a smoker, you could put, put the head of your cigarette on their ass, man. They're out of there in a heartbeat. What about the mosquitoes? Mosquitoes, you just took, you just got bite after bite after bite, you know. There was nothing, nothing I knew to do about them. I mean, we tried lots of different things. But nobody ever came up with anything, you know. If you, you couldn't really use off or something that smelled, you know. And you mentioned it rained all the time during the wet season. Oh, yeah. But you didn't like using the ponchos. Why was that? Because of the noise factor. And also because uh, they get caught on vines and stuff in the jungle and just tear the shit, you know, just tear them up anyway. I mean, I, I carried one with me just in case, you know, that uh, if we were in a, a bunker position or something, you know, we could put, I could throw one over. If it was raining, you know, mm -hmm. I could at least put it over, over that position, you know. Yeah, I was out one night on a ambush, and uh, no, it wasn't an ambush. It was just a regular patrol, and there was about eight of us, nine of us. I didn't know everybody in there. It was part of my platoon, but you know, different squad. Maybe it was some others. Half half our squad, you know, squad I was in, half the other squad. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in a squad. I was a platoon medic, so I just, but. I hung with the first squad generally, just because I knew them all. But anyway, we were out and we were sleeping. We had our feet in the middle. We were like a, a wagon wheel with your feet in the middle and your body laid out prone, you know, looking out. So everybody had a look, at, you know, all the way around you were looking. And that's the way, that's generally the way we, we uh, slept or that's the way we had our, our self set up, you know, at night if there was just a small group of us. It was like that in wagon wheel position. Uh -huh. And, you know, I was sleeping. I mean, I don't know, I never slept well. I didn't sleep well at all. I mean, besides, especially after that, and then after that happened, I really had a hard time sleeping. But, you know, all of a sudden, man, I hear just a, a blood-curdling scream and, you know, and just more screaming. And I said, why don't we, why don't we shoot a flare? You know, because North, man, I mean, we're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and we don't want to give our position away. But uh, uh, I don't know that we could have done anything. We found the guy the next day would had decapitated. A tiger had gotten him. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've I've read about some of the other tiger stories that I've seen in Vietnam, and uh, I read one where a guy was walking the the last man in line. And you're always supposed to watch your rear, you know, to see if somebody's behind, you know, tr trying to sneak up on you. And uh, he kept hearing something, and then he'd turn around and just see some rustling. And he finally saw it come out, and it was a tiger. And evidently, there was a lot more of them over there than we knew about. 
And so what happened in this case is the tiger just came right into your camp. Just and came right in, right into our little perimeter. And he pulled someone out of the foxhole. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was probably, I was in the wagon wheel, in the roundness of a wagon wheel, I was probably here, and that guy was probably here. You know, he was away from me. I didn't, I wasn't right next to him, you know. Less than, say, 20 feet from you, right? Oh, no, I mean, his feet were touching my feet. Uh Oh, so he was right next to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, as far as being right next to him where the tiger came and got him, he had to have got him from the front. And just pulled him right out. Yeah, because we were laid out like this. You know, and everybody's, you know, and then when you, when it's time for guard or something, all you do is just touch the guy on the next to you. You don't have to. Oh, you know bullshit going on, you know. You're not making any noise, and you can get it done real quick. And you told me that's probably one of the most terrifying experiences you've ever had. It was. Yeah, after that, I didn't. I wasn't able to sleep for for years after that experience. And, and what was it about that that bothered you so much? the suddenness of it and uh, uh, you've heard you hear thing you hear stuff about that but you never actually have experienced it and that was you know that experience was not a, it was a terrible experience and uh, I don't know I just want to I in my wildest dreams did I ever think that would happen you know but yet it did, it happened, and it happened right where I was, you know, and that, I think, blew me away. Did it make you feel like even the jungle was out to get you, like you didn't belong there? It makes you feel like that, that you're such a minor part of it all. You're just, you know, you're part of the damn food, food stream, you know? And you would say that experience scared you in a way a lot of the firefights didn't. Didn't, right, right. Yeah, I mean, in a firefight, you can generally, you know what's happening. But on something like that happened, I mean, it took us, we didn't even really understand what was happening, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, you thought maybe the NBA were trying to come into your camp or yeah. something. Right, right, I mean, you know, just that scream, you know. And that was a haunting scream. And it, it didn't stop. It continued for just a bit. But that tiger was already gone, man, you know. You just found the footprints, right? Right, right. We found him about 100, maybe 150 feet from, the, from where we were. The head? And then we found his body. So the tiger dragged his whole body? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you didn't sleep much after that? No, not after that. Not after that. I mean, I was, How did you function? Okay, on a lot of adrenaline, and you know, and I'd, I'd grab, I, don't get me wrong, I mean, I'd, I'd probably sleep and didn't even realize I was sleeping, you know? Yeah, just short little bursts, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, uh, there's some things that you just never plan for, and that was one of them. I had no, no contingency for that, you know. I didn't know. I, uh, and nobody, nobody else did either. Uh, I don't think any of us. All we were was a bunch of kids that didn't know what to do, you know. I don't know what we could have done.
How long would you be out on a typical mission? We'd be out for different periods of time. Sometimes we'd be out in, in long-range reconnaissance now. You only go out for four or five days. But in infantry, you could go out for 30 days. You could be out there for 60 days, just running ambush after ambush. Did you do a 60-dayer? Oh, yeah, I did one and a bunch of 30-dayers, and then we'd go in back in base camp for two days for a stand, called a stand down. And so that entire time, you wouldn't bathe or change clothes? No, no, uh-uh. You'd probably change clothes one time. Okay, so you had one extra set of clothes. No, we didn't, but they'd bring out a whole big old thing of fatigues and stuff. It didn't have them broken down to size or anything. You just went through them and see if you could find your size. And then we sent back the old crap, and either they recycled it or they threw it out, you know. When the mission was over and you came back to camp, yeah. what was that like? It was it was nice. They'd always have a, a case of beer, you know. I mean, a, not a case, but a pallet of beer. Slits and uh, some crum other crummy beer, but, you know, it was, it was beer. Paps Blue Ribbon, I think. How long would you be in for? We'd be in for two days. That was it? That was it, yeah. Apart from the normal infantry, you did some time with the LERP as well, the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol. Right. Yeah, and the way I got into that is I was, I was went in for an R&R &R and uh, I saw Dr. Murray and he asked me, you know, he said, you know, I know you've been out a long time out in the field. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you know, how would you like to do some other stuff? And I said, I would, I would, I need to get out of there, you know. And so he told me, you know, that the LERP teams had been running, and, but not with medics. And he said that they, they were now wanting to have a medic with them. And so he said, you know, that I'd been out in the, with the infantry long enough, and he felt like that I was qualified to do that. So that's how I got hooked up with that. For those not familiar, can you talk a little bit about what LERP is and how it's different from the infantry? The LRP, Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, you know, that's what it is. Yeah, LERP, yeah. And, uh, It was a, the, the LERP thing was not like the infantry at all. They were more not wanting to get in any contact whatsoever. Their job was to strictly observe and to bring in information, you know, uh, vital information or information on, or to call in. Now, if, if a LERP team saw 200 North Vietnamese, they could call in airstrikes, they could call in artillery, they could call in everything and throw the, you know, the book at them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that, that was okay to do that. But as far as just trying to, you know, ambush 40 or 50 North Vietnamese with four guys or five guys didn't, didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was, I think the scaredest I ever got was we were on, we, I was on a alert patrol with five other guys and um, we saw about 200 North Vietnamese walk right by us as close to you. We were, in, we were in the bushes, deep, thick bushes, looking out at them, looking at their feet walking by. They, couldn't, they didn't see us. You were next to a trail? Yeah, right on a trail, right on a trail. And they were probably, what, three or four feet away? Yeah, five feet away, maybe. About 200 people. Yeah. And my heart was going, I could feel it in my head, you know, it was going real hard, you know. Mm. And it was a, and, it, and I knew that it was, a, that was adrenaline. Because when we get in a firefight, or that's, that adrenaline would kick in like that, too. It's funny, you know, you get that real heightened 
thing of adrenaline and then it then you come down off of it and sometimes uh you either laugh or you cry about you know after you've spent a bunch of adrenaline Mm -hmm. it's funny what happened then on the trail well we what we did is we let them get by us and they they were just they were just tip hoppy down the trail you know they had their guns slung on their shoulders and stuff nobody was nobody was it they weren't fearful that there was any americans around Mm -hmm. They were smoking cigarettes and stuff, you know. I mean, which we never, we didn't, you, man, you, you didn't take cigarettes out there in the, lur- in the infantry. You could smoke, you know, when you're humping during the day. Or, you know, if you'd stop. And that probably, uh, in, like I said, infantry is so much different. I mean, and I think they, they, uh, the thing is, it doesn't matter <clears throat> whether there was North Vietnamese around or not, you know, <clears throat> with the infantry. But it's. Would you say you felt safer with the LERP than you did with the infantry? Definitely felt safer. Yes, yes. Just because everyone was on a strict stealth mission. Right, right. Yes, yes. And I was what's called a strap hanger. And strap hangers, they were they were qualified to do LERP stuff. And they just, but they weren't assigned to any certain LERP company. And so which, or LERP platoon. So what you could do is you could go, you could go to another company and ask them, do they need, do they need an extra person, you know, because if they were going with four or five, you know, they might only have three or they might only have four and they want five. So I kind of got to float around, which was kind of neat. Can you talk about any really memorable missions you had with the LERP? Yeah, I mean, we had, uh, we saw we got some pictures of trucks that the North Vietnamese had, and and they were driving them up and up and down around uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, mm-hmm. and they brought them over into South Vietnam and in Asha Valley, and we got pictures of that. So I thought that was pretty good. We also planted. Uh, some ammunition, uh, bad ammunition that was, it, that, and we dropped it all around. And if they picked that up and used it in their rifles and shit, it'd blow them up. And on that uh, previous trail you were talking about, you executed an ambush, correct? Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, ambushes are funny things too. I mean, uh, you want you have what's called a kill zone, and that's where you want to. That's where you want to pull the ambush to start it. And generally, the first man who's the point man of the enemy will be walking, you know, in front there, and you let him actually walk through the kill zone. And then wait for the the rest of the main body to get in there. And then we had Claymore mines set up, and we had and then a lot of grenades. We had our grenades out, and we used those. The LERPs, more or less, we they try we try not to fire our weapons, our our M16s at first because it gave away your position so early, you know. If you could use the claymores and the grenades, they don't know where they're coming from. And so thus, you know, you really caught them off surprise. But if you have your M16s, they see those muzzle flash- flashes and stuff, and they can, you know, find you. They see you immediately. Mm-hmm. So... uh so that's how you pull an ambush, and uh, uh, luckily, most of the ambushes I was was were involved in 
were maybe at the most 20, 20 men, 20 North Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And uh, we usually, amazingly enough, five of us could knock out 20 within just less than a minute. And what was the trick? You'd set off the claymores at the right point? Yeah, well, the claymores would be pointing on both sides of the trail, mm -hmm. be pointing in towards the trail. Yeah. And then you got them on both sides. And so, I mean, you'd cut them in half, you know, with the claymores. I mean, they're shooting out ball bearings about that big, hundreds of them. Yeah, it's like a giant shotgun. Yeah, I mean, a huge shot, because they're about, the claymore is about this big and about that tall. Sits on a little stand that's kind of concave, and you set out the, the concave like this, you know. You don't want to turn it around and have it concave towards you. And then you'd also call in air support, correct? Right, yeah. You break. You go ahead and do that. You go ahead and blow your claymores, do your grenades, and go ahead and open up with your 16s on full automatic, and then break contact, and then start calling in artillery or airstrikes, whatever you know, whatever was closest. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, the artillery, you know, was firing at seven, eight miles away. You know, some of it 12 miles. That's a long damn way. That artillery, man, I mean, it, you know, they, we, I never was in a short round, but I got in some pretty rounds that were pretty close. And, man, the shrapnel, when they hit, the shrapnel just go. I mean, it's all over the place, the shrapnel is. Big pieces, too. Man, if it hits you, God almighty, you know, it'll kill you in a second. How long were you over in Vietnam? Uh, 12 months. 12 months? Mm -hmm. And during that time, was there several times you got to go on leave? Yeah, yeah, I got to go, got to go on R&R &R and went to uh, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, Singapore. How was that? That oh, was great, great. A lot of drinking, a lot of women. How long did you go on R&R &R for? Uh, five days. Five days? And that was kind of in the middle of your tour? Yeah, or? it's whenever you could, you know, I got my last two towards the, you know, the last four or five months of my tour, I took two. I took one more, or I got, you got two R&Rs, and then you could take a seven-day leave if you could get it. And I, I had plenty of leave, so I, I took one. Okay, so you got three. Yeah, yeah. And Uncle Sam paid, for, you know, they flew me over there and back. I had to pay for my hotel, and drinks and food and everything else involved. How long were you running with the infantry? And then when did you start running with the LERP? Ran about seven months with the infantry and about five with the LERP. And I probably did about 10, about, we did probably 15 missions, 10, 15 missions. Just a lot of, uh, trying to find, you know, where this battalion was or where this regiment was of North Vietnamese and stuff, you know, some crazy stuff, just not, not so much, you know, not, don't go get in contact, but go tell us where this base camp is or where this medical facility is. Shit, how, you know, how the fuck do we know, you know? as opposed to the infantry where you were just doing search and destroy. Search and destroy, yeah, they had to stop calling it search and destroy because it got, it got, some people back in the States didn't like that description. Yeah, a lot of ambushes, a lot of search and destroys, you know. Ambush every night. Uh, ambush during the day sometimes, you know, ambush, ambush, ambush. That's all they wanted to do. How were you feeling when you were getting close to the end of your tour? Paranoid. I felt very paranoid. I felt like I uh, was not going to make it. You know, I think I think when you get down to the end there, 
and you hadn't had anything serious happen to you just and you see everybody else or you know not everybody else but a lot of people had serious stuff happen to them and you ask why not me you know mm-hmm. i mean i've had people right next to me shot and why not me you know i i mean it should have been me I don't know if it should have been or not, but you think you think those things. Would you say you felt some survivor's guilt? Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely, definitely survivor's guilt. And things just being completely out of your control. Yeah, because you know when I when I got there, I mean, medics lasted about a month out in the field, and then generally you get get shot because it's such a it's such a was such a screwy thing. I mean, the North Vietnamese knew the lieutenants, the radio men, and the medics because as soon as somebody get hit, what do they do? Call doc, doc or medic, you know, and and you go up there, and that's the North Vietnamese know that you know as soon as somebody gets hit, they're gonna medics gonna go up there and try to give them you know first aid and get them out of there, and so they just wait for you. So I just, you just got to be a little, little bit, hopefully, smarter than they are. I don't know that I was or not, but anyway. Was there a point where you felt like you were just going to function and make it through, and you didn't think you were going to survive, but you accepted that? Yeah. Finally, when you when you accept it, it's it's be, it's a good thing. Do you feel like you accepted that pretty early on? No, it took me a while in. You know, it took me probably three or four months into the into the infantry to think. You know, it may have been earlier than that because you know I never felt. Once I felt like you know, okay, so if it happens, it happens, you know, so what can I do about it? Not a damn thing, you know. So once you accept it, it's it's much better on you. What about leaving Vietnam? Did you think about re-enlisting or did you have any other offers or anything? I thought about extending, you know, I mean, uh, my tour, I could have extended for six more months in Vietnam and got, I could have made another stripe. And which would have been pretty good, you know, to make another stripe. Yeah. I made two stripes over there, E4 and E5. And E5 was sergeant and E6 is staff sergeant. So I could have made staff if I would have stayed over six more months. but. My old buddy, Dr. Murray, said, I can't guarantee you what you're going to be doing, you know. He said, you may be right back out humping in the infantry. Because, you know, I mean, as things happen and you're the only medic standing there, you know, they say, well, hell, you know, we need him out here worse than he's needed in here. What about the CIA? Did they approach you? Oh, yeah, the CIA approaches everybody, practically, as they're coming out of Vietnam, you know. What's their offer? Go work for the company. <laughs> they but if something they, happens, they're not coming they're, to save they're you, not, right? They don't know anything about you. What about finally leaving? Do you remember how you felt? I mean, I felt so relieved, you know. When, when you got on the plane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet it was just an amazing sense of relief. Oh, uh, yeah. But you know, when I got home, man, I was kind of like, it, I, I didn't do well at home when I went home before I went over to Germany. What year was this? Uh, 1970. 1970? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when you got back to the United States, were there people protesting? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, big time. And were people screaming at you coming off the plane? Yeah, yeah, and air, going to the airport, you know, s- s- there were people screaming at us, you know. it. Uh, we got back to Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco, and that's, you know, San Francisco, of course, you know, people, 
at the airport screaming at you and shit. Mm -hmm. But because I had a uniform on. Because I was flying home, you know. I mean, and you know, we got to fly at a special rate, standby, you know. And you had to wear your uniform. I mean, I had no choice. I was still in the Army, you know. I wasn't discharged. And then so you were stationed in Germany. Uh-huh. How long were you there? Uh, about 18 months. So you did two and a half years. Uh, two years and nine months. Just got out early for school. Well, is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I, 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 just, I just think that, you know, it's the kids and stuff see on the movies and stuff about combat, and it, you know, and I watched it myself when I was a kid, and you just don't really know what it's all about till you get there. And I just wonder, you know, uh, we used to play with all the toy soldiers and stuff, you know, and uh, burying them under the, the that's how we have the bombs hit and stuff, you know, and it'd knock them down and stuff, but they would get them right back up. You never thought about somebody getting killed, you know, mm -hmm. and you didn't ever think about all the sounds and the smells and all the things that went in when there was combat. I mean, it was just, it was, heck, it was, it was hectic. It was, it was, I don't know what it was. It was helter skelter, I guess is a good word for it. It's like being in a blender. 